Hi everybody. It's been a while, but I am back to do part five and hopefully the finish of our coloring with Derwent ink tents in Flowers and Dreams. And um, between the last time I saw you or talked to you and now, uh, as you can see, I've been doing a little playing around. I, my plan was I wanted to try a black background, and um, if it messed up, I was going to pull another copy of the book and um, recolor it up to the up to the point where we stopped. But as it turns out, I kind of liked it, uh, so that's what I've done. I uh, and I've left a part of it here, so I can show you exactly what I did and what I used. Um, the things that I did use are basically a Sharpie Ultra Fine Point. I used to draw with these, but they bleed. Um, I still have a fresh box, so I pulled a brand new one out and it worked like a charm. And then the other one that I have is the actual Industrial Super Permanent Ink uh, Sharpie Black. And uh, that's what I used to sort of fill in the big areas. And of course, I've been out just learning all kinds of wonderful things about coloring and coloring techniques and uh, Derwent ink tents and um, just all kinds of things. Hang on, I'm... I'm... Uh, Trying to adjust the light here so that I get a little bit more of it. And um, I wanted to uh, say thank you to the reception that I got for the face-to-face, -face, um, <laughs> the face-to-face -face video. It was um, it was fun to do, and uh, and given that I am just really camera shy. I surprised myself by doing it at all and then to have it so well received just made my day. So you guys, thank you. You made my day. You made my week, my month, the whole bit. And speaking of making the month, it has cooled down here in Virginia. Thank goodness. Uh, we had a downright chilly day today, but it is, and it's been of course rainy. But it is supposed to be nicer, um, hopefully uh, over the weekend. And um, as we approach November 1st, and I am willing to turn the heat on again, then maybe I can run around in my t-shirt in the house. But for now, I prefer to save that cost. Okay, so uh, where were we on this? Okay, so um, filling in the black. Show you how I do these little itty bitty tiny spaces like where the pearls are. Let me see if I can get a better focus. That looks pretty good from here. Hopefully you can see that too. I'm going to remove this clip again after I so carefully got it put back on. Move it over just a bit. Okay. So um, this is sort of fine detail work. And it's hard for me to grab at that angle. Let me move some stuff around so you can still see, but I can still reach. And at a certain point, you just have to be brave and go for it.
And don't be afraid to use a magnifying glass if you need one. I was watching. I was really, really lucky. Karen um, Zucchini Kitty, uh, if you, uh, she has a YouTube channel, and that's what it's called, Zucchini Kitty, all one word. And she did a page from my book, Flowers and Flyers, and I was just, I was, I watched it, I was absolutely mesmerized. It's a two-part tutorial video, and she did it with the um, uh, Distress Inks, Tim Holtz Distress Inks, and uh, pencils, and it is absolutely the most stunning thing that I have seen in a long time. Karen is such a talent, and she's so um, peaceful. She's very zen. And so listening to her talk about what she's doing and why she's doing it and how it's working, and it's just so inspirational. So I can so recommend every video that she has made I have learned something from, and I'm going to apply a technique that I saw her do here on this frame. So um, if you get a chance, go see Zucchini Kitty. I will put a link uh, in, the, in the description. I'll also put a link to um, A Colorful Life for anybody that might not already belong there or have, you know, already subscribed to that channel. Although I just can't imagine that there are any of you who subscribed to me that didn't get here by way of Anne. <laughs> so, thank you, Anne. All right, so I'm just filling in. Basically, I'm just filling in the little white spaces. Trying my best to just be careful about the... Um, you know, about just sort of matching up my own lines. Now, I will say that I did the first section over there, and you can see it on the back because it's the one that didn't bleed through. I did that with a Micron brush pen, uh, a Sakura uh, Micron brush pen, because they're part of my set of drawing pens um, it's one of the I'm just trying to find it there it is that's this pen here and it's got the fine brush tip point and that was really wonderful to really get into these Fine little details. This one's got something hanging out on the end there. But in the end, I liked the Sharpie better um, for this particular application. That brush is just a little bit too stiff. Okay, now that you've seen the close-up of the pearls, let's back off just a tad. Give me a little more room to work. Um, now what I do is on bigger areas like this, I outline them. This, by the way, is not an art supply. This I got when I, um, I inherited my aunt's Hummel collection. Now, I love my aunt, and I, and the Hummels were very cute, but the bottom line is, is that there were about 400 of them, and I just have no room to display them, nor did I have any desire 
uh, to dust them. And so I sold them. And I will tell you that the market for Hummels is pretty depressed. But um, I used the, I bought a whole box of these so that I could mark all the boxes that I used for shipping fragile and, uh, you know, this end up and that kind of thing. So these are really more for an industrial use than an art use. But since I had them left over, I figured why not just employ them for something useful like filling in wide black spaces. This is probably pretty boring to watch. Which is why I only left one section to do for you guys, and I did all the others. The others myself. Okay. So how is everybody? What have you been up to that I don't already know about? If I haven't encountered you in a stream somewhere. And. I have been enjoying. All the different people. Um, and of course I have, have uh, been loving all the flip throughs of the new. Joanna Basford book. Uh, I don't happen to have any Joanna Basfords, but um, but that one looks fine. And uh, the one I love though is the uh, the new Denise Clet. I I love her art anyway, and so the uh, the gnomes in the neighborhood is just adorable. Absolutely adorable. I put it on my wish list. Speaking of which, speaking of wish lists, there's been a whole lot of people that have been disappearing their wish lists and they're all doing it for the same reason. They don't want to, um, they're doing it for the same reason that I've done it. And that is, they, that's not what, that's not what we're about. That's not, you know, when we make videos for the coloring community, we're not doing it in exchange for gifts. And, um, which is why so many of us have disappeared our wish lists. And that is, the, the, the sensitivity to that has come um, from a source that none of us should be influenced by in any way. And so I am going to publish my wish list. And on it are the things that either A, I would really like to try, like gouache. I would like to try gouache. So I put a couple of budget-friendly gouaches on there. And I will buy them for myself, but they are also on my wish list. Um, because I can't afford them right now. Uh, the other thing that I've done is I've decided that I want to use my wish list to help my independent artists, my fellow independent artists. So I have put coloring books that I 
from artists that I absolutely love. Only the ones that I absolutely love. The Christina McAllisters. The um, <coughs> Rob Roscom. <coughs> if you don't know who Rob Roscom is, um, check out Robert's Illustrations. All one word on um, Facebook. And or check out his two books. It's Rob or Robert R O B E R T Roscom R O S K A M, like Mary. And I'll put links to his books down in the description of this video as well. But Rob has done two botanical books. Um, one called Botanical One, and the other one is called. Botanical Volume 2 that are absolutely amazing. Talk about gorgeous art. I first encountered Rob on Facebook. I saw his art and I also saw that he wasn't getting any attention. And so I contacted him and I said, Buddy, you are too good to not be getting any attention. What can I do to help? And so whenever I get a chance, I tell people on Facebook about it. And it occurred to me the other day that I hadn't mentioned anything on YouTube. So I am absolutely mentioning it right this very minute. Okay, now, so we finished the black. And I've been debating as to whether or not I should bump the colors up here with a second coat of ink tints or if I should just go ahead and use the Prismacolor pencils. Now, I have certainly seen other people use Prismas over um, Derwent. My only experience to date with that had been this. And it was this flower right here. And I didn't like the way that it turned out. I didn't like this page at all. Although I'm liking it. I'm liking it a little more as time goes by. Um, so I hadn't really done it. But then... I was working on, back out one more here, I was working on this. Now this is now finished and this is a page from my book uh, that I don't have a copy of to show you. Uh, Fantasy Flower Garden. Now, I uh, verified with my records that I released this book in March of this year. And um, like many artists, I get caught up in, so caught up in drawing that I, you know, I dropped the marketing ball. And I really dropped the marketing ball on this one. So I decided that I really needed to pick it up by coloring something in the book. And so that is what I've done. And this is it. And since I love ink tents, um, and I'm just playing with the focus a little bit here, I have, um, I used uh, Derwent ink tents. And um, then I was watching Dee Dee the other day, and she was talking about, you know, most people, when they're unhappy with a result, or when they're, they've used all the same colors that they see someone else use, but their work doesn't look the same, that the problem is almost always in the amount of contrast. And so I got to looking at what I had done on this, and I realized that 
as wonderful as Inktense is, unless you're really, really good with it, um, and you know, and patient and willing to layer and all of that, it's easier to just bump up the contrast with the colored pencils. And so that's what I did on this one. Uh, I'm going to zoom you down here. Zoom, 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 zoom. And show you that, okay, now, this does not have any other colors on the outside at all. This is just simply uh, two shades of ink tents layered over one another. Uh, but in here, I did bump up the contrast. Not only did I do it with colored pencil uh, using, the, uh, using the fuchsia color, I believe, in my Prismacolor set, or not fuchsia, um, I think it was the red violet uh, that I used. But I also took out the white uh, pencil and just did some highlights around. And doesn't that give it a nice effect? Um, I did the same thing. The uh, berries were a, a beautiful shade of blue. <coughs> Excuse me. But when I bumped it up with the uh, Prismacolor pencils and, you know, really increased the darkness around the outside of each of the berries uh, and uh, went over the highlight with the lightest shade of blue in the box, it really gave them a much richer, more... Um, it really gave them more depth, I think. So I applied that theory all over um, all over this piece. As you can see down here at the bottom, uh, this was all a you know a beautiful shade it was actually this uh, this fern color up here. The color is actually fern, I believe. Um, but I bumped it up with the darker olive. Uh, and then, actually, I used black and, you know, really deepened the shadows and increased the contrast. And I did that all over it. Uh, you know, the blues, um, you know, really, it, you know, just, it adds so much depth and dimension. So, I guess... When you think you're done, you're not really done. <laughs> you can always bump the color and the contrast a little bit more. And that is the difference between the, you know, the 86 likes on Facebook and the 3 or the 5. Um, the difference is the contrast and people who really understand color. So you have to kind of study color. Now, I had never colored a rock before, keeping in mind that I may draw these these images, but I, I come new to coloring, very much like all of you. Um, and so I had never drawn a rock before. And so I looked up and uh, Betty, oh, I want to call her Betty Wang, um, had a video. She's a marvelous colorist called How to Color a Rock. And she colors these rocks. I swear they look like photographs. And so I used her techniques. I obviously applied applied them more to my, you know, little cartoony mouse, but her uh, squirrel. Uh, and this was just the first try. But I think I did okay. I mean, I'm kind of really pleased with the depth of these rocks, the all the different colors that I used. There's easily six or seven shades of color in those rocks. This one down here was just a complete accident. I was uh, bumping it up with a little gray. I thought I'd you know add a little gray 
over the beige and I then I went over it with a uh, with the was it the white no I know what it was it was the cream the cream pencil and it smeared the uh, gray around instead of blending it and I thought ooh that's a cool effect so that's what that rock is and um, so yeah I was I was going ooh that is that's cool okay, zooming out and zooming out and zooming out oh jeez silly me I wanted to zoom in because this is what I'm so proud of. Look at my little squirrely with his little white around his eyes and his little fur all going in almost the right directions. I could have I could have brought this a little more curvy around here. Um, and maybe made him a little less all sort of a uniform different colors and all of that but I am so proud of his tail I am telling you what I worked really hard on that tail and uh, the little whites I bumped in with um, just a, a white uniball you know a white uh, uh, just as, as a, a last afterthought and they really just sort of set that tail off so I am very proud of my very first effort coloring fur and uh, I'm I'm delighted with how this one turned out. I've been toying with doing a background. Um, I can't decide if I want to. to um, I guess I'm like a lot of you. I'm afraid because I like it so much that if I do a, try and do a background, I'm going to mess it up. And um, but I do think that I should do a little dirt color. You know, maybe a little brown garden soil down here at the bottom. Um, and maybe an, uh, a nice sort of yellowish uh, sunshiny sky fading up to blue. A blue cerulean sky. <clears throat> I don't know. That'll be for another day. Okay. Now that I've done waxing poetic about that, that t told me about this, which is, you know, should we go ahead and bump up another layer of color with the ink tents, or should we just touch it up with the Prismacolor pencils? And I think that we should do the Prismacolors because I am also going to uh, do the frame with a technique that I saw Karen at Zucchini Kitty use. So let's do that. On the other hand, the name of this video is Coloring with Darwin Ink Tints. So let's not do that. Let's see if we can do it. Almost like I planned it this way, huh? <laughs> Let's see if we can do it with the ink tips. Hang on, I'm trying to... I filled all my brushes today. I'm just trying to find the one I want to use. So let's do that. Now remember that since these are ink tents, we don't have to be exact about where we're putting color. <coughs> because we're just going to, uh, we're just going to activate it with water anyway and move it around. So this is really just See what we can do on this one. This one was the one that we were going to bump up anyway, 
because uh, because I had been much more competent in the way I'd used used it there. But we'll do this one as well while we're here. Just maybe not as much. I don't want this to go on forever. But on the other hand, I do want to show you what's possible with these products on, especially on CreateSpace paper, um, which is now, of course, fully absorbed into Kindle, uh, Kindle Direct Publishing. Uh, I do believe that these were Tangerine. So you can see I'm just being very, or maybe you can't see since I seem to be coloring off the screen, I'm just being very Very loose, um, about a medium pressure, and just adding some additional color there. And let's even um, bump out just a little bit of the fuchsia out here on these outer flowers uh, just so we have a little more color there I'm the the fade I don't like the way the fade looks on the camera you know what they say about good coloring don't you takes time oops As I pull the hole, I'm afraid I'm going to knock my pencils off the back side of the desk. And that would not be a good thing. Uh, what do I, let's see, do I have any stories? See, where did I leave you in my last storytelling venture? Uh, well, I think I left you with my mother had passed away. I was 20, and I was living in Sedona. I left Sedona, went to the city to find a job, which I did. Got a job for an accounting agency. <coughs> and... Uh, did that for a little while. Then I decided, <laughs> in my infinite youthful wisdom, that it was time to go back to California. After all, my dad lived in California. Um, uh, you know, basically my family was there. It did, however, mean that I was pretty much leaving my best friend behind uh, in Arizona. But I got, you know, I would, would be able to visit and do all of that kind of stuff. And, and I could be in, you know, have an excuse to come back because I, I did, in fact, love Arizona. Um, it's, it is really beautiful country. Uh, but you really kind of have to uh, you have to like the desert. You have to really not be afraid of things like uh, bugs. Uh, they have a bug there called a vinegaroo. And uh, it looks like a cross between a potato bug and a scorpion. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it... And now, I don't know this for a fact. 
but they say that if you get bit by one, that everything uh, smells and tastes like vinegar. And that's why it's called a vinegaroo. I don't, that may be a, a tale of some, some sort, but who knows. Um, all right, so let's see how this, how this ends up working out. Like in the orange. Like in that pink. Well, that looks pretty good. All right, so let's wet the whole thing and then pull and pull. So we'll get our get our richness back in that way. And as anybody who has viewed any of my colorings knows, I do have a tendency to go for those bright colors. Uh, that that squirrel thing is the squirrel picture is probably the most subtle that I've been with color in quite a while. I can either go very very bright or very very subtle. Uh, so my art is elegant. My coloring is bright. Uh, okay, so vinegar ruse. Talking about okay, living in the desert, loved it. Okay, so now I'm in my my youthful wisdom. I decide <coughs> that I want to work on the in the financial district um, on Wilshire in Los Angeles. Now, uh, the city of Los Angeles has. A street that runs from Beverly Hills to downtown, and it's called Wilcher Boulevard. And it's where all the, you know, the hot shot LA businesses, you know, the, it's the equivalent of Wall Street in um, New York. So, Now, at this point in time, remember that I have uh, graduated from high school with a uh, the what's called the I took the California High School Proficiency Exam, which gives you it's different than a GED. It's like the equivalent of an actual diploma, um, as if you had finished all the work. Um, of school, you're just basically you've tested out and you're graduating early. So that is the difference between those two things. Whereas a GED you go for after the fact. Um, I just tested out early. All right, so I end up living in a place called uh, La Crescenta which is up in the San Gabriel, it's right at the foot of the San Gabriel mountain range. And it's a lovely, I mean, it's a lovely little town. La Cañada is its neighbor. It's just right a couple of cities throw from uh, Pasadena. And uh, it's a, a, a perfect burb to live in if you work in the financial district of Los Angeles. <laughs> now keep in mind that I'm an accountant. All right, I, you know, I, I started uh, working for my mom at age 13. Uh, I worked for her on and off, doing all kinds of accounting over the years. But uh, I have no formal training, no school, uh, you know, certainly no college at that point. Or anything. So, why I think I'm going to be able to get a job 
uh, in the financial district of Los Angeles is completely beyond me. At and, you know, looking back at it as an adult. Uh, but I was gung ho, and so I, uh, you know, went out and bought uh, a couple of suits, you know, really good suits, and I spiffed up my resume full of lies, <laughs> and uh, and I went looking for a job, and of course, if you are looking for a job in L.A. of that kind, you go through a headhunter. So, I signed up with a headhunter, and, uh, you know, they interviewed me, and then they sent me out on a few interviews, and then they called me in, and, <laughs> and of course, you know, they said, you are really good at selling yourself. <laughs> so why don't you come to work for us? <laughs> because I had, I, you know, I kept getting all of these offers, but on the, you know, as soon as they went to, to check the, check my references, they found out I was like, you know, full of crap. <laughs> so, uh, this looks really bright right now. It looks solid. <coughs> Excuse me. But it won't dry that way, I promise. So anyway, so then I, then okay. Now I'm, now of course, the, the reason why I took the job is because they had an office on Wilshire Boulevard. Uh, fifth floor of a really prestigious building. Before I knew what I was, what, what was happening, I was making so much money I could just, it was just incredible. Uh, at the time, uh, one of the big aerospace engineering companies was hiring like crazy. Absolutely hiring like crazy. For uh, they were doing the, uh, they were building one of the uh, the stealth bomber that had just come out, and so they were looking for database analysts and programmers and just you know basically if you knew something about computers could walk and and uh, and had a pulse, they were hiring. Now, they, you know, obviously they only hired the cream of the crop, but there was, there was just a ton of cream at the time. And so, because um, the whole IT thing was still fairly new, uh, and so people were graduating with these, you know, IT degrees all over the place. And a headhunter gets a big percentage of the first year's annual salary as a commission and dependent upon uh, how much money you make, your share of that pot goes up and up and up. So now here I am, I'm 23 years old by this point, driving a Fancy, dancy car, talking about buying my own house, and realizing that I hate my job. I hate my job. It wasn't, I see it, I say that, but today I don't hate, there's nothing I hate, um, because I don't believe in hate anymore. But I can say I hated that job. And it just felt so unfair because after a certain point of time, 
the demand got to be so large <clears throat> that the norm would be to place somebody in a job, have them stay there long enough for the commission to be guaranteed because, you know, if they don't stay a certain length of time, you don't get to keep the commission kind of thing. And then pull them out and place them somewhere else and get another commission. And that had become the norm. And I don't have a dishonest bone in my body. The idea makes me physically ill. And I, I just, I couldn't do it. And I got to the point where I wouldn't do it. And my employer and I parted ways in no friendly fashion. Believe me, I, it was not a friendly passion. But I was also, I, you know, I, I was financially hooked because I, you know, was driving this car that was costing me. In 1982 dollars, 83 dollars, it was costing me $650 a month to drive that car. And that was a lot of money. Cars have always been my thing. They've always been my weakness. I love cars. And I was driving a 300Z, a 300 Turbo Z. And uh, with a T top. I love that car. But one day the dealership found it in their driveway with the keys in it and a note from me that said, Sorry guys, cannot afford this car anymore. Goodbye. Uh, I went to my dad's house and he was kind enough to let me borrow his Fiat. He had a little, uh, little gray and silver four-door sedan made by Fiat and uh, and <laughs> Fiat of course stands for Fix It Again Tony <laughs> because there was always something going wrong with that car. Uh, by then of course I had become a much better driver than my 16 year old self that That, uh, did I tell you that? Yeah, I told you that story about the car and call me when my, call me and tell me where my car is. Uh, so the fact that my dad actually gave me a car to drive at all was sort of amazing, but. So I, uh. Ended up, now, one of the things that happened early on in my story, I think I told you that uh, when I was 17, and I, or, yeah, 16, 17, and I left home, I was actually 17, uh, my mother let me go. Well, that is true to the extent of, yes, she did let me go, but she also... Uh, made sure that I had a place to live. So uh, I found an apartment to rent and she had a client down the mountain. I lived down the mountain. Uh, and so in order to keep her hand and her eye on me, she basically rented a room from me in this two-bedroom apartment, uh, which she would then use on the days when she needed to be down the hill uh, at this client's and didn't want to uh, drive all the way back up the mountain, especially if it was winter and there was bad weather. So... 
Well, one of the people that I met in the condo complex, which is what we called it, uh, is the lady who eventually became my mentor as an escrow officer. Now, Ivy, my friend Ivy, bless her soul, uh, is one of those people. You know those people. She is... She's... Well, I met her... I first met her out by the pool. And there she is, sitting on a lounge chair, literally surrounded by good-looking guys. And, you know, she's got the long jet black hair and the perfect olive complexion and and she's got this personality that just is like a magnet to everybody not just men but women everybody everybody loves Ivy she has that kind of personality and i did not like her on sight and for all the all those stupid reasons, jealousy, uh, you know, thinking that life was always going to always so easy for her, all those things, none of which, of course, were true, because she was nice, and she actually allowed me to get to know her uh, before passing judgment on me for being such a jerk to her. And uh, and she eventually taught me a trade that kept me in good employment for the next 30 years. And, uh, and that was pretty amazing. She, I am, uh, she still sort of brags about our relationship because... Uh, when I first, all I asked her for was a, uh, was a job as a receptionist. I was, des uh, she lived in Palm Springs. I, uh, as I had mentioned before, I had not left my job on good terms. Uh, I had basically burned that bridge. Uh, so I needed to get the heck out of Los Angeles. Just because uh, I just I just had such a bitter taste <clears throat> for the business practices, the phoniness, the the you know the plastic people, the whole nine yards. <laughs> Can you tell I don't really like L.A. anymore? Um. So, I go to work at the escrow company, work on the front desk and just, you know, answering the phones and making copies and, you know, greeting people and doing all of that. <clears throat> and because I cannot uh, sit with, you know, for any length of time without something to do, I used to pull the files uh, the closed files, closed escrow files, and read them. And look at all the documents inside uh, and look at the closing statements. Because, you know, I had a, a background in, in accounting, so, you know, I recognized balance sheet, for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know, all the, the legal documents, the legal ease, I'm probably one of the few people that's actually ever read a real estate contract from cover to cover, from front to back, and every word in between, and more than once. Uh, and all kinds of them. Commercial real estate, uh, residential real estate, lease, because much of Palm Springs is on Indian lease land. Uh... Okay.
I am liking that. Uh, there was all of that. Just take a little bit of fuchsia off the tip here. Sort of. Just give these just a little, little zhuzh there. Uh, so at any rate, uh, I asked, whoops, sorry, I asked Ivy if uh, she would ever consider letting me work on an escrow. She's like, it takes years to learn to do this job. And I was like, okay. So I just went back to studying files. Another couple of months went by. I'd been there about six months. <coughs> and I asked her again. And she said, do you even know how to figure a file? I said, well, I don't know. Give me something to work on. She says, well, here's one that you've never seen. Because she saw that I was studying the files. Here's one that you've never seen. Here's the, you know, the invoices, the the contract, the escrow instructions, the signed documents, the whole nine yards, the loan documents. Figure the file, is what she said. Figure the file. And so that's what I did. I just sat there and it took me about uh, 30 minutes. And I went through every page in the file and uh, saw what was there and then prepared a closing statement. Because that's where the, you know, that's where the key is. It's right there in that closing statement. That's when you're talking about the money. And she looked at my balance state. I had made one mistake, uh, and it was minor. Had to do with I didn't use the right proration dates for the uh, water bills. <laughs> and so she gave me a job as an escrow, a junior escrow officer on a subdivision. And so that's what I did. I worked that and then moved my way up the ranks till eventually I was a certified senior escrow officer giving other people a chance. But that was 25 years later. And in another life. So right in, I loved, I have to say, I loved living in Palm Springs. It was, um, it was miserable three months out of the year, but I'd lived in Arizona, so I was used to that. But you really just go from your air-conditioned house to your air-conditioned car to your air-conditioned office, and after work you go to the air-conditioned bar, and then you go home and have some dinner and live in your lovely air-conditioned environment until it all starts the next day again. And then for nine months out of the year, it's just gorgeous. You know, just really, really gorgeous. All right. We'll bump one more up and then we'll call that part of it done. Gosh, I hope that when those dry, those will actually change color. Otherwise, they really are awfully bright. Hmm. 
May, I might have screwed up and put down too much pigment. Hi everybody, I've been away and back. It is now the next day. Um, I have been tweaking some things in my computer to try and get a smoother playback of this video. Um, I to with limited success. So I do apologize if the video is glitchy for you. Um, while I have been away, I have been working a little bit on this and I wanted to show you some of the things that I've done. Uh, the first thing I did is I bumped up all of the colors except for the blue because I kind of like this denim -y effect. So I just went through off camera, bumped up all the greens and all the yellows and then I started now to bump up the see if I can get you down here a little more and I've started to bump up the con contrast and I have been using a series of uh, Prismacolor pencils to do this and um, for instance since uh, the fuchsia and orange are both warm colors. I used a uh, magenta, which is the PC930, and then I also, to bump up the shadows and sort of bring out a little more contrast between these paddles, and I don't know if you can can actually see that or not. See if I can play with the focus a little bit. There you go. Um, you can see that I've, I've been bringing that down. One of the things about coloring, and I of course learn this every time I go see either Sammy or Dee Dee or anybody like that, is that the difference between average coloring and good coloring is in the contrast. It's in the darks and the lights and the contrast between the two. So um, I bumped these up. You know, I used the process red, the magenta, and then I bumped it up with a little bit of gray. And... Um, to really bring out those highlights. Then, of course, with this yellow flower, um, you know, the yellow and golden flower, I bump those up with the goldenrod, the sunshine yellow, and then for the darker areas to go around and sort of go between the petals, I used the Sienna Brown. For um, some of these little areas over here, um, and actually I haven't done these with water yet. I, I missed these two with water. Uh, but I was using the Beach Green, and I did go through. I'm not super fond of the beach green so once again I went over it but since green is a cool color I used the 70 percent cool gray as opposed to the warm gray so I used the cool gray on the cool colors and the warm gray the 70 percent warm gray on the warm colors and I just wanted to show you on this flower um, just all I, you know, all I really did. So I just took the magenta. Actually, yeah. Is it the, yeah, I took the magenta and sort of just not every place, but just any place that I felt like needed a little bit of bump out, bumped up. And then the 70% 
warm gray and just not very much pressure but just went around the very edges underneath these flower petals and added a little bit of shading and then I just basically just followed to one side of each of these lines and just put down a little little color and that is oops I don't imagine you can see that with my hand in the creating such a shadow but just to one side or the other just to give you a um, an indicator that these are separate petals and then if you decide that you've gotten it a little bit too dark you can always blend it back down with another lighter shade so that's how I did those. Uh, so uh, that is the, the process that I'm going through. I'm just going through and bumping everything up. Now over here uh, in the uh, side feathers I used the process red. No, I actually this is where I, I used the magenta again and I uh, really zhuzhed up the the bottoms here just to make them quite a bit darker and really add into that contrast lighter pressure out here so that it creates a nice blend harder pressure down toward the base put a little in over here And then I actually went full on black here and just added starting out sort of lightly and just down here at the very base added a little black to give it some depth because in here would be really dark so what this does, of course, is it adds dimension and adds depth and makes it look more like it's actually curling downward. And that's really what it's all about in, um, in coloring is creating illusions. You're really creating illusions with color. So now I've gone with a, the lighter process red to sort of blend that in. I'm just going right over it which then gives it a little warmth so it's not quite so harsh. So with your coloring, you're able to create illusions of depth 
with color. So just like that. Now it looks like like it's a deeper, you know, like it's more more dimensional. Then if you so we'll move over here and we'll add some black shadows in here. Not very deep or you know, not very far out. To sort of lighten that you start out at the bottom with sort of a heavier pressure and then lighten it out like a little flick mark. Flick, 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 flick. And flick, flick, flick. And then use our process rat again to just sort of smooth that out. and give the illusion of depth. Oh, I know what I do. Okay. Let's try bumping that up again. That's better. Okay. So we've added a little depth there. Um, I've added depth around here. I'll continue to add, you know, av after the camera's off, I'll continue to add um, a little more depth here. But now we need to think about the edges, uh, this frame. And um, I was thinking that it would be a cool wood frame, um, cool to do it as a wood frame, let me put my uh, pencils back. Now, I would apply the same principles that I did to this flower. Oh, that's what I was going to do. I was going to show you this flower up here. Um, I already made... What I did is I colored the center uh, with the golden... I used uh, the goldenrod around the outside and then blend it over it with the um, sunburst yellow and then use the brown around the center. And so then I can just simply add a little brown just right here along the edge of the petals, which just gives it a little more depth. And a little more contrast between the petals. And then you can actually blend it in. Just like that. And uh, you could, at this point in time, continue on around with your warm gray. Once again, not, you know, not a whole lot of pressure, just a little bit. You're just wanting to create a shadow uh, effect. And since we are sort of looking at these from the top, the shadow could go all the way around, but just like if you're looking at something at an angle, the shadow is only at the bottom. I put it all the way around because technically I like to be able to 
turn things and have them look the same. Um, <laughs> which sort of shows up in my work, since it is, in fact, symmetrical. All right, so we've done all of that. Um, I did bump the green because the green down here is a cool color um, in order to um, uh, bump it just a little bit more with the contrast. I did use the warm gray. Then if you really want to add some shading to this, once again, you would just simply trace this line with the black just heavier on the line and just sort of feathering it up as you're coming away from it which creates the illusion that there is depth or a space between this which is holding this leaf and this sort of flower so like a vase and cool gray these are greens even though they are the, 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 this particular shade of springy green um, even is to the cool side of the green family as opposed to say a fern green which would be more to the, um, or an olive green, I guess. And olive green is more to the warm side of the green family. There are a few things that I know <laughs> about color. Um, great person to learn about color from. Uh, and I have been impressed by every video of hers that I've seen is Color My World. Uh, Lori at Color My World. I have watched two episodes of um, her videos discussing Prismacolors. She is a Prismacolor expert. And um, the two videos that I saw, she is uh, has started to go through the box, the 150 color box, one group of pencils at a time, and the amount of knowledge that she has about the Prismacolor product, how the colors blend together, color combinations, is massive. Absolutely massive. And I cannot recommend that series enough. I have, um, I have for the first time put the 150 set of Prismacolors um, in my wish list because A, they are something that I, they are my favorite pencils. They always have been. She has <clears throat> restored my love for them and made me really other than the Black Widows that, um, that I am currently collecting, um, they're the only pencils that I ever imagine that I will ever need. I have the set of um, Polychromos wannabes, which are a marvelous oil pencil, but I am a Prismacolor girl. I, you know, I, there's just... No getting around it. I like these Prismacolors a lot. I like the ink tents a lot. Um, I have found the things that I love. And um, so you can, you know, zhuzh up your colors. And it's really just a matter of playing with it until you're happy. Um, I, I did see a, an interesting little piece uh, by a lady who said, uh, you know, she 
she goes back and looks at work that she did uh, years ago that she's never been quite happy with. And really what it was, was that she just wasn't finished yet. So she added contrasts and um, and created, <coughs> excuse me, new depth in her work. And it really improved the work. Okay, and uh, I did stop and start the video again. While we were gone, I experimented with uh, just adding a little bit of shading around the lines. Basically, I'm just outlining this with my black pencil, and I kind of like the way it looks. So I'm going to do it again on this one. And I think it just uh, it just adds a little bit of extra depth. Not not very hard, you know, not hard pressure or anything. Just sort of lightly outline those thin lines. It just sort of bumps up the the contrast a little. Or the, the definition makes it m look a little more 3D. Just a hint of, yeah, see that looks, it just makes them look much more um, defined. I really like the way this blue color turned out. Looks like old washed denim. That used to be one of my favorite you know, the look, the, the, uh, there was that time, and I guess we still have it, where you wouldn't want to be caught, it, caught dead in brand new denim looking pants. You needed to have the old washed out ones. Now, I always drew the line at the ripped ones, but I liked, I liked washed out denim. And living in Nevada, uh, of course, that was the uniform of choice for a lot of people. One of the <clears throat> things that I liked best about living in Nevada for the 15 years that I was there is there was no, um, there was no defined upper class. Um, you know, certainly we got dressed up to go to the opera, uh, of which, you know, Nevada has a, a, Reno, Nevada, has a wonderful opera company, vibrant theater, um, but so much of Nevada is about gaming, and so, uh, you know, really great musical acts. You could see anybody you wanted, um, would eventually come to Reno. And, of course, Reno is... People always say, oh, well, you know, you must have gotten to Las Vegas a lot. You could go to Las Vegas and see a show. But what people don't understand about many of the western states is that they're huge. When you think about it, there are um, three western states on the entire west coast. California, which is sort of long and relatively narrow, Oregon, and Washington. Whereas on the East Coast, you have, um, what, you have uh, Maine and New Hampshire and New York and, you know, I'm just coming down the coast, uh, Massachusetts, um, New York, Delaware, uh, 
Virginia, North Dakota, South Dakota, Georgia, and then I think finally Florida. There might be a little there might be a little fork of something sticking out there between Georgia and Florida. I'm not certain. I have to look at a map to know. Um, but I guess the point is is that, uh, <laughs> and there is one, um, the point is that uh, Reno, Nevada is about as far from Las Vegas as uh, Georgia is from D.C. And um, and so, no, we we didn't really get there very often. Whoops, sorry, I'm off camera again. Um, but at any rate, but lots of other things came to us. And um, but no vi uh, visual class system is where I, I was really going to go with that. The the guy wearing the, you know, the, the nasty dust-covered jeans standing next to you at a street parade could just as easily be John Esquaga, who owns one of the huge casinos um, in Reno, as it is likely to be a miner, you know, just down from the hills. Uh, where he's been mining gold in his claim. And that is really the charm of um, of Nevada, as far as I'm concerned. You just never know. Now, obviously, when you get down to <clears throat> Las Vegas, um, it could be the same, except I think that um, Las Vegas is much more insular of its um, celebrity people. Uh, they have a tendency to um, be much more, I guess, protected from the people. Whereas Reno, you know, sort of anything goes. And of course, there's a little town next to Reno called Sparks. And the... the uh, joke is that Reno is so close to hell you can see sparks. Um, <laughs> I'm really just shouldn't be doing that with the gray, I should be doing that with the black. Just bumping up those lines just a tad. Just those little touches of shadow that sort of give the illusion of depth, three-dimensionality. And that's what we want in our coloring. So I think we were, I will continue doing, you know, doing the little details on that. Um long after the camera is turned over I'll be tweaking this but let's look kind of where we are now <clears throat> and what to do with the frame I could do the frame in pencil and um, but what fun would that be when we have a chance to make some magic with our ink tents so let's make some magic with our ink tents um, I'm just switching out my trays so I can access my browns and see if we can come up here just a little bit. Make sure I've got uh, sort of centered. I'll come back down with the uh, um, with the camera, but I just wanted to back out so we could see where we were and go to the swatch book to choose a brown.
So I have been thinking that... Perhaps the because what I ultimately I want to do is I want to give this a curved dimensional feel, um, very much like. Uh, like Virginia did on the cover that she did for the book. I do realize that now, excepting for the fact that I changed, switched out, you know, some colors here in the center, I have really done exactly the same color palette that she did. So color credit for this color palette's got to go to Virginia Sanders Cole, who colored my cover. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of maybe, I know tan. Maybe saddle brown. I like the yellowish, well, actually, you know what I really like is that mustard. I really, I do, the mustard and the amber. Let's try the amber. I like that warm shade of amber. Maybe the tan. Amber or tan to start, because we can always, we're starting with a light color so we can always go darker. Um, so let's start with mustard. We'll start with mustard. That's the tan, that's the amber, and that is the mustard. Okay. So we will just now, I won't make you watch this whole thing. Um, I just didn't know where to start here. But let's just start by putting down some pigment. We're just going to play. and see how this goes. So, um, I went out to the uh, door to see if there was any mail. And, you know, of course it's Saturday, so hanging on the door are like 15 different vote for me tags, you know, hang door hangers. And I'm like, yeah, like that is going to make me want to vote for you. You know, tell me why to vote for you. And... But I, for one, can hardly wait until the midterm elections, <coughs> excuse me, here in the United States are over. But then I am at that point in every election cycle where we get, you know, kind of down to the last week or two, and it's just relentless. The negative advertisement from all the different players in the game is just ridiculous. Now, they wouldn't do it if it wasn't effective. 
<coughs> Excuse me. And that, I think, is what I find so disappointing. I find the fact that advertising, negative advertising, works to be very disappointing. <coughs> so consequently, I have turned off the television again until after the election. Because I already know who I'm going to vote for. And uh, I know who I'm going to vote for because I did my research. I know the issues that are important to me. And I know where the people who I'm going to vote for are standing on those particular issues. So if it's a personality contest... I don't want to be involved. <laughs> if they've got something to bring to the table, then I'm all in. I'm all ears. I'll absolutely listen to anything they have to say. Um, but I, I'm, you know, but this negative for negative sake, so-and-so did such-and-such on such-and-such a date. Here it is. It's in the paper. And, and, but what they've done is, you know, twist the, twist the facts to whatever side is presenting the data. And so, because I am a citizen who likes to take the responsibility of voting seriously, um, I do my research and I actually look up the minutes of meetings and I, um, you know, because it's all available online. All you have to do is be curious. Um, but all of your state legislature meetings, all of that, all of that, the minutes of those meetings, how the vote went, <coughs> all of that, what they discussed that day, it's all online. So go find out. And I'm having a little flow problem here with this brush today. So, like you, or wherever you happen to live, if you live in a democracy where you get the opportunity to vote, do you get to a certain point in an election cycle where you just say, enough is enough? Ooh, yes. This is the wonderful thing about the Derwent Ink Tents. It is <coughs> such wonderful magic. Trying to get my blood pressure back down now. <coughs> When I think of politics and all the nastiness, I get I get a little worked up. There's just no room for all that meanness in the world, you know. I saw a great meme the other day about you know think of the. How wonderful it would be if we came up with a rule that said politicians were no longer allowed to talk about why they, why we shouldn't vote for the other guy, 
They are only allowed to talk about why we should vote for them. And I thought that would be a wonderful rule. Okay. So now, unfortunately, we have to let this dry <coughs> before we can apply any more color to it um, because, of course, we are still realistically working on Create Space Paper. Um, and so we do have to be very careful that we let the layers dry in between. So I will be back the moment that this dries and we will continue on. Okay, well here we are. Um, a significant amount of time has passed. A couple of hours. Um, while I was waiting for this one to dry, I continued on with the rest of the frame. Uh, the first thing I did is, of course, I laid down the uh, mustard color of the Derwent ink tins. And then over here, uh, I, as soon as it was dry, I added uh, along the edges, <coughs> excuse me, along the edges and in the little corners, uh, and along up and down both sides, I added the saddle brown. And then I wet it and let it dry. Then I did and went back in with a third layer of willow, which is a darker brown still, still in the yellow family of browns, though. I haven't crossed over to the reds. Um, and then I made an even narrower uh, strip and wet that. And all of this is adding uh, dimension to the frame. And then up here, this is the last part that I did. After I did all of this, Uh, I then added, with the Prismacolor pencils, I used the dark brown. Um, I didn't use the, um, well, I did use a little bit of the Sienna brown, but not very much. And then I also used the black on the very outer edge. So. What I did was I went, you know, I used the pencil right along the edge and feathered it in on both sides and over here. And then I used the black and just gave it a very, very thin, uh, just tracing the, the line, really. And it really made this whole section pop like it's round. Um, I don't know if you can actually see that or not. But I left this side to show you exactly what I did. So, um, let's do that. And we are with the ink tens. We will put the Prismas out of the way. Avoid the confusion. So these are the two ink tents. Once again, the lighter color, or the second one I put down, is the Saddle Brown. And the third one is the Willow. So using the Saddle Brown, all I really did was just put a light layer 
along the sides. Then I sort of worked it around. Worked it in a little bit. Kind of went in and gave a little dimension where I thought it should be darker. Um, you know, in the creases. Along the stem to kind of give that a little dimensionality. <clears throat> very, very calm pressure. Virtually, you know, you're just letting the pencil do the work. And lay down a little pigment. One of the um, cool things that Reno has every year is a hot air balloon event. And so, I don't remember in what month it takes place. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I don't remember in what month it takes place now. Um, but... The house that I lived in, uh, occasionally, we would get a series of balloons that would fly overhead. And you could always, you always knew that they were overhead because, of course, the big old furnaces that they have on those that create the hot air that keeps them aloft are really loud really really loud so if they're flying over your house at six o'clock in the morning and they have to fire up that furnace to gain a little altitude yeah you it can definitely wake you up out of a sound sleep it's like surprise we're overhead But it's cool to then, you know, run out in the front yard and look up and wave at the uh, all the people in the in the baskets going flying by. And then, of course, there's um, the the real event is I think the event runs for. It's either three or five days. I, I don't remember exactly which. But if you are willing to get up really early <clears throat> and go up to the McCarran Park, which is where the base of the daily events are. I don't think it's called McCarran Park. It's on McCarran. And I don't... Uh, the street is... McCarran is a street that makes a huge loop around the whole Reno, the whole city of Reno. Um, I guess like the Beltway does around D.C. And uh, But if you get up and go out there, then you get to see the Dawn Patrol. And um, the Dawn Patrol, of course, is when they send the balloons up in the dark and the furnaces all light up and it creates this really cool light show. Really, really cool light show. It's really worth seeing at least once. And, um, I, you know, the things are just dangerous as all get out. <laughs> the hot air balloons. I, you're dealing with fire and nylon and, and uh, you know, wicker baskets. And they're huge. Hey, these things are not small. They are absolutely gigantic. And the baskets are gigantic. And, you know, they have the, the 
baskets that can hold 10 people and you know that there's got to be a huge balloon to lift that much weight huge furnaces uh, usually the ones that uh, you can put that many people in have dual furnaces in you know dual fire apparatus whatever it is that because it's an open flame an absolutely open flame They are much braver than I am. I, I I thought about going up in one one time. I got as far as into the gondola, and then I sort of changed my mind. I'm not particularly afraid of heights. Um, I'm afraid of falling. And it's it's not the height that uh, that because I can stand on the the edge of the Grand Canyon and I don't have any problem with the height as long as I'm not worried that I you know somebody's gonna push me over the edge kind of thing because it's the fall that'll kill you Reno also has a chili cook-off that is just to die for. A, a chili cook-off, they have a uh, an annual rib event. People come from all over the country to John Esquaga's um, rib cook-off. And now that event goes for I think it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And they cook uh, something like 50,000 pounds of ribs. And John Esquaga provides all the ribs to the, uh, to the cook, to the contestants. So he's got huge ranches. You know, one of the reasons why He's so rich is not only because he owns a casino, but also because he has uh, livestock, you know, ranches, working ranches. But he was, uh, <laughs> he sat next to me at the bar one night when, uh, I mean, I didn't go hang out at the bar, but I was in the casino waiting to go, waiting for a show to start. And um, my date wasn't there yet. And uh, I looked over and sat next to me was John Esquaga. So he bought me a drink. I thought that was nice of him. Nice enough fellow. I was, at the time, <coughs> I was the president of the Escrow Association, and so we had the Northern Nevada Escrow Association, to be clear. Um, and we used to have our monthly events there at the Nugget. Okay, so that is the... Um, so that's the second layer on our frame, and we need to let that dry. But while that is drying, um, I thought I would show you the finish after the third layer. <coughs> and I picked this side only because it's easier to access than trying to wrestle my way into the fold. So all I really did uh, on this was to sort of, now, you know, once again, now these are the Prismacolor pencils. Oh, one of the reasons why I put Prismacolors on my list is with all of the um, stuff that I've been watching on 
learning, you know, to master prismas, I discovered that, you know, I really got to thinking about it. I have this 72 set, which I absolutely love. And it's always, I've always thought that, you know, it was all the colors that I ever needed. And that is actually true. But it's also um, less than half the set. And so Lori over at Color My World was using all these colors in her combinations that I don't have. So that's why I have finally broken down and decided that I need the... Oops, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that I had been coloring that completely off camera. Well, I'll catch the above one. Okay. Actually, I can show you here in the corner. So I just brought it down just a little bit and feathered it up, made that one sort of darker. And feathered that up and then Just outlined it very, very lightly with the black. And that just pops it up. This one should be easier to see. It's much easier for me to reach. So just, you know, maybe uh, an eighth of an inch. You're, you're probably working up just about a really light pressure. You're layering the color. Uh, you know, basically you're just blending it in there. And then toward the very, very edge, you can go ahead and put a little more pressure to get the, you know, to, to really sort of get that pop of, and that's wet. And if you want to, you can just bump up your contrast there on the flower. and maybe along the outside. Of that, then switch to the black. That was the dark brown that I was working with. And just put in a very, very tiny, tiny bit and just pop it right out. And this is slightly, this is the, um, the Sienna Brown which is slightly red, but if you lay it over the black just a tiny bit to blend it, it works pretty well. Actually, it just happens to be the pen that I had with, or pencil I had within reach. 
So that is the way that works. Now let's um, give, this is actually, you know, this is pretty dry. Let's see if we can get the pencil to, or the um, other color of the ink tents on it. Okay, so we already used the Saddle Brown, and this is the Willow. So, just along the edge. And I am using fairly firm pressure, although not hard, just because what I'm really trying to do is just by darkening the edges, you're giving it dimension. Sorry, got a little off screen again. Once again, in your corners. side curves okay you don't have to be exact here because you're just going for an effect you're going for a you know if you think about wood wood isn't perfect it is it's wood it's over the years it's had wind and rain and dry seasons and wet seasons and insect infestations and all the things that actually give wood its character. So wood doesn't ever have to be perfect. Now this is not a grainy wood, because I'm uh, now one of the things that uh, that Karen did, Zucchini Kitty, in her recent coloring of my work, <laughs> which was so kind of her. She did a picture from, uh, <coughs> excuse me, from Flowers and Flyers. And she put this amazing wood frame on it that she colored in. And that was what I thought I wanted to do here, but I changed my mind and decided to go for a more of a golden oak frame instead.
And of course, one of the reasons why we like oak so much is that it's very tightly, it's a very tight growing grain. And so the grains doesn't, the grain in oak is virtually transparent. Most of it just glows golden. In case you wonder what that noise is, that's my ring hitting the dish on my on my uh, left side here. Every time I pick my coffee cup up. Okay. Whoops. Okay, so that's good. All that needs now is the um, the uh, finish of the Prismacolor pencils, and we can finally, after five episodes <laughs> of me going on and on and on and on, we are going to finally be able to call this one done and I don't know about you but I am pretty darn satisfied with that um, is it perfect nope uh, is it uh, one of the favorite things that I've colored yep <laughs> it surely is and the added benefit is I got to do it with you and um, I got to hear your uh, lovely feedback and, um, you know, and I've just really enjoyed this process. I have also learned an awful lot. I will say that I have learned about um, coloring tutorial or coloring example best practices from uh, Zucchini Kitty. She makes really interesting videos and because she shows you in a small area and then she disappears and doesn't make you watch all of the repetitive stuff and so I think that if I do more more uh, tutorial style uh, videos that I am going to adopt that way of doing it um, sort of similar to what, the way that I've ended this whole process uh, of this one. And then, of course, I will do um, just sort of color alongs as well uh, with some stories. I'll have to figure out what stories I've told and what stories uh, I haven't. And, um, and we'll go from there. But uh, until the, uh, the next time, Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you liked this demonstration of how I use Derwent Ink Tents. Uh, they are, in fact, my favorite tool right now. And, uh, and I am loving learning how to use them. And so I will see you all later. And until I do, color something pretty. Thank you.